Hello and welcome to Engaging and Empowering School Libraries, a podcast that aims to raise the profile of school libraries by talking about topics that are current across education and teaching. This week we're talking about campaigning for school libraries and why it's important. The Great School Libraries campaign was set up four years ago as a joint venture between the School Library Association, SILIP, which is the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals, and SILIP SLG, which is the School Library Group. Tonight I'm joined by my co-host and school librarian Sabrina Cox and our guests um, this evening are the joint chairs of the campaign Alison Tarrant who is the CEO of the School Library Association and, and Mary Rose Greaves a school librarian working at the Heartland International School of Dubai. I was going to say she'd stayed up very late but she hasn't stayed up too late. She's um, she, It's only 10 o'clock so we're very grateful that she has stayed up so late. Um, there's always lots to talk about on social media about school libraries and I was delighted when I heard that the campaign was going to be launched in 2019 and some of you may know that I was part of phase one which was heavily hampered, hampered by things um, over the last few years um, such as Covid. But we did carry on and I'm delighted to say that the campaign is still going strong. So Alison, can I start with you? Thank you for, for coming tonight. Can I get you to tell us how the Great School Libraries campaign actually started and what's it all about? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for inviting us both to chat to you tonight. Um, so the Great School Libraries came, uh, campaign came about, I mean, if we go back into the history as a result of the beating heart of the school report, and that was released in 2014 and contained a series of recommendations about how things should be moved forwards for the school library sector. Um, one of the key recommendations was that more data needed to be collected around school libraries. So um, a whole group of organisations got together to kind of look at that report and see how things could, move, could be moved forward. And out of that, Nick Poole, who is Silip CEO, um, decided that actually, you know, a campaign was really needed for school libraries. Um, he was a pupil library helper in his school when he was at secondary, and he is incredibly passionate about school libraries. So he came up with the, the idea of a campaign. Um, so Great School Libraries launched in 2019 to collect the data and to raise the profile of school libraries in the UK. And then phase two of the campaign started um, at the beginning of last year. It's been quite a quite a journey, hasn't it? I, that, it that, yeah. that first campaign, that first three years, you know, COVID did have a huge impact, mm -hmm. didn't it? But, yeah. but we were collecting data that first time round. Was it easier yeah. the second time round, the data collection? Do you know what, in, in some ways, because a lot of the kind of relationships had already been built. Um, so particularly with funders, like we launched phase two at the beginning of last year. We weren't sure how long it was gonna take us to get the levels of funding that we needed. Um, so we were thinking like maybe the autumn, maybe the spring, and actually it all came together really, really quickly due to the fantastic funders that we were able to work with. Um, so yeah, and so the timeline got accelerated. Yeah. Based on based on the foundation that you'd started in 20, that first three years, it, it, yeah. the campaign became something that was of value in order to be involved with at a later date. So that it, that worked. It, it can, it, would you say that it, it managed to fulfill uh, at least its function that way if it wasn't able to do everything that it did plan to do yeah I mean I think lots of things had to pivot and change during Covid and I think our campaign was one of them you know go, trying to go to government and talk to them about school libraries while they're dealing with all of the things that they were dealing with would have been you know slightly <laughs> ridiculous to be honest Absolutely. I think we can all admit that however much we love school libraries yeah yeah um you know, so you've just got to adapt to the to the situation that you're in. And actually, you know, we managed to do the data collection and release the report in 2019. And and then, you know, things kind of pivoted and the work then instead of being around kind of policy makers and senior leaders in education went to, OK, 
we've got a whole bunch and network of really passionate um school librarians so how can we utilize the like these brains and this passion and so you know the collection of case studies and looking at you know two or three particular areas where school libraries have an impact you know that was incredibly valuable work um yeah and you know I still point people to the case studies on the great school libraries website um you know because they're just so good Um, absolutely and people were so happy people were happy to share weren't they 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 there was a lot of differentiation and and um people willing to to spend a lot of time writing about what it is that they do it was it was a fascinating time really fascinating so Mm. so yeah um so you mentioned actually I'm going to stick with you Alison for just a minute longer you you mentioned government um it being impossible for the for the COVID situation um but it seems to have pivoted um so has the campaign now got government traction or is it something that's still to come? So I think there's, um, you know, two two perspectives to that question. One of them is that, you know, do we have MPs paying attention to what we're saying? Yes, absolutely, we do. And that's hugely positive. That's so great. we launched the report at the beginning of March at the House of Commons, supported by Jill Furness MP, who is the chair of the Libraries or Party Parliamentary Group. And we were really pleased that we had MPs in attendance, we had Lords in attendance, um, as well as kind of wider sector bodies and interested people. Um, We've written to a a number of MPs and Lords about the campaign and the research, just saying, okay, guys, this this is out there now. Um, and, you know, and that's something that we're going to continue to to build. Um, you know, we're still only, you know, less than halfway through phase two um, and relationships like that do take time. Um, but everyone's kind of really invested in it. And we are, I think one of the things that I'm most pleased with from phase one is the fact that that initial bit of research really did kind of mm, take the seal off the conversation about school libraries. And we then, you know, that um, that first bit of research was covered on BBC Breakfast, it was in The Guardian, it was in lots of, lots of newspapers, both national and local. And I think the, the needle has moved in terms of the conversation in the sense that people are more aware of the you know the benefits of school libraries and the fact that they're important I think there's still some way to go in terms of the nuance and what that looks like but that that baseline has moved and part of that is because of the great work of both the book trust and their life-changing libraries campaign headed up up by Cressida Cowell um, and the National Literacy Trust and their primary school library alliance that kind of managed to keep the conversation going um when you know the great school libraries campaign was finding it quite difficult and I think that's that's a difference in size and resourcing potentially between those two larger organizations and then you know Silip and you know the SLA's pretty small so um <laughs> you know we've all got different kind of um skills and different kind of foci but actually that really enabled the sector to work together and um, to move that needle in terms of opening the conversation up around school libraries absolutely it's about bringing everybody together isn't it so you're now in the second phase i'm going to bring mary rose in this time so you started with another survey report can you tell us a bit more about this survey and the reasons for carrying it out Yes, so um, the second survey, obviously we started that after COVID. Um, so we were, we, it's and allowed us to get a really good snapshot of what ha- what things were like pre and post COVID. Um, we had a whole new lot of funding and more people involved. So our methodologies were able to change a bit. It wasn't an exact replica of what we did before. We were able to deepen the questions, push further, a bit further into um, really mining the data and really having a look to see the difference between primary and secondary sectors. And then geographically too, we were really able to focus down on 
um, different regions, different nations, and, and what it looked like in, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and England, which we weren't able to do before. So um, it, it's a much bigger research project. We've got much more data. We have much bigger data set to work with. But it also has been interesting to be able to see trends and see what the difference has been between in the first survey and, and the second one. Um, so I think it gave us um, a really good set of data, but, but really what was important was that it's given us a, a really good idea of what we need to do next. It's shown us um, where we need to work on perceptions of what, what a school librarian is and does, what a school library can do. Um, I think, I think one of the things that I certainly found quite clear was that often head teachers, I think the expectation of what a school library is, is perhaps not quite as clear or for us as school librarians, we know all the things we can do. But I think often um, it seemed from this from the data that we got that the expectation of school leaders is perhaps much narrower in their field you know it's reading for pleasure and it's a room it's a room with books in it and it looks all cozy with new well-being but but actually what we realized was that there's an awful lot about our job that, that perhaps they're not exploiting and understanding so so while it gave us um a really good set of data it were really also kind of allowed us to create um or start working towards creating a real vision of where we need to go and what we need to do that sounds really exciting. Is there it was there trends that surprised you? Uh, you know, I think I think I seem to remember that the the first phase survey showed that schools that were in areas of deprivation were less likely to have a library school library. Was that still the yeah, case? Yeah, that, that, that is. Yeah, yeah, that is still the case. I mean, children who are. are at schools where there's a higher proportion of children who receive free school meals are less likely to have a library space less likely to have funding, less likely to have a school librarian. Um, I mean, I mean, it is surprise. It's it's awful, but not necessarily surprising. I mean, no, you know, absolutely. That, that is um, what happens. I think, I mean, we were also slightly, I, I mean, they're slightly encouraged to see that we, that the data between um, pre and post COVID didn't show an enormous reduction in the in the provision for particularly primary school libraries. It, we were expecting, I think, to see a much greater um, or, or de decrease in those numbers, but it wasn't as, as huge as we thought it was going to be, um, which isn't to say that it was entirely positive. I mean, it, it, you know, it isn't necessarily positive, but it's not as bad as we were it's as we thought it might have might have been but certainly um the free uh, you know free school meals uh, you know is that really is is an area that you know the, the the equality the social justice element of um of reading of being having access to books you know this stuff is crucial and if we're if if it's not if it is not equal, if, there, if children do not have, if it's a postcode lottery, if where they live means they don't have access to books and reading, and those children we know are less likely to have books in their own home, you know, that we're starting already from a really unequal base, and that's the stuff that we need to start looking at. Absolutely. Um, I'm just, I'm going to go off piste ever so slightly, um, and, and I pose a question that I haven't shared with you, but it's just come into my head. Ofsted recently did a webinar about reading and in the whole webinar didn't mention libraries or, or, or oops, librarians once. Obviously, they are a, a, um, a, a, somebody that is really important within schools. You know, things, we, uh, you know, if, we've been, if anybody's been reading anything or listening to anything on social media, Ofsted are in a very difficult position at the minute. But the fact that they don't even mention libraries. Do you think that that's the same? Because it generally tends to be, doesn't it, uh, head teachers or or ex head teachers that are part of the offset inspection. Do you think that comes back to the fact that they don't know? Do you think, Alison? Let me let me bring you in there to answer that one. Thank you. I just wanted to bring in something that happened in the first part of the campaign in phase one, which was. Um, we asked um, Swindon North 
MP Justin Tomlinson to write to the Department um, of Education to ask them to put a question in the school census around reading provision and school libraries. And, um, and he did that, he was very happy to do that, very happy to help. Um, the response that we got back was that the department felt it would be a waste of taxpayers' money. And the logic that they used was that because it's not statutory, it's not worth counting them because we're not saying you have to have them. So therefore, why are we bothered if you do have them? So, I, so do you think it's got something to do with the fact that schools could be could feel as if they would be marked down because of their not I, I think yeah. that there is a potentially um a similar logic at play whereby if they mention school libraries um then people will feel like they have to have one and as that is something that the department of education is not kind of actively endorsing let's say um that potentially you know puts puts them at, at other um, at different positions that being said they do and they they do mention school libraries um in some of their work that they do particularly recently a reading framework kind of case study that was looking at reading in key stage um in, case, in secondary school and there they they kind of actively said you know, I think they looked at six schools, so it wasn't a mass study, but these six schools, four of them had school librarians and um, a, n- a number of them were kind of proactively pulled out and, and celebrated as having been pivotal in making an impact in, in the reading of the pupils. So I think there are places where you can see that. And I've seen um, recent Ofsted inspections praise, you know, pupil library helper, pupil library assistant programs in schools. Um, But I do think it's really difficult because there is such a focus on reading already. Absolutely. And building a reading culture. And, you know, it is, it's almost logical that if you're going to build a reading culture, you need access to books and resources. I just think they don't want to be that prescriptive in in how they do that, despite the fact that there there is a mountain of research about all the other impacts that come from having a school library. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's a it's an interesting one for for us. Well, it's certainly one to to keep in mind, isn't it, going forward, and and the opportunity to to talk to people and to Ofsted, like the fact that they were, you know, promoting this webinar and giving you an opportunity to comment is is a step forward, isn't it? Because you can, yeah. You can yeah. raise, raise um, ideas in a wider context than than potentially be the than you ever could before. So you know, yeah. there's good um, and bad to all of it. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's almost like a kind of a middle ground where you know there's there's a question that floats out there whenever this this conversation is being had around if Ofsted did start inspecting school libraries, who would do the inspection? Do you want senior leaders who maybe never worked with the school library to suddenly come in and tell you your school library is no good? So there's a question over kind of authority and expertise. Um, But I think there is also an onus on, you know, on us, on people who work in school libraries to almost flip the question. And instead of saying, will this, uh, will the inspector come and see me? Go, how can I get my impact visible to the school inspector? And that's by looking at the areas that they will be talking about and interested in and being proactive with providing that information to the people who will be talking to them. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Can I bring Mary Rose back in? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That one, one of the great one of the great things about being a school librarian is that we're allowed we because we're not encumbered by the inspection process or by data and results and outcomes we are able to have a much more holistic approach to the work that we do and to um to be a little to be more creative innovative imaginative pioneering um and and you know arguably uh, if we become part of an inspection framework those those things that that potential that we have to be able to challenge, push boundaries, try something new, is perhaps 
possibly limited so I think there is you know while it's really important that that there should be an expectation across the board that every school has a library and a librarian in it um that as soon as we you know what we don't want to do is then get to the point where we're um where we're limiting ourselves by um by somebody from somewhere plucking a definition of what they expect a library to look like and and thereby limiting it so you know there's a lot of things we need to do but I mean I I was the Ofsted not to mention us but you know the Times Education Commission also didn't mention school school libraries you know it is it is a, a really peculiar thing that something that if you ask anybody I, I can't think of a single person who would say oh no children shouldn't have access to books and a library and a librarian and yeah. yet it's somehow something of a political hot potato and and nobody wants to really come out and say yes this needs to happen and and really uh, you know uh, uh, underneath it all that uh, I think you know the people with the purse strings are the ones who who know that that this is where we're going to be where things are going to be difficult and that putting more and more pressure on head teachers to to magic money out of thin air is is not going to do our cause much good um it's, so- it's, it's interesting you're saying that that we should be championing championing things that we are proud of and finding ways to fit in with with the Ofsted inspection I, I was talking to somebody just the other day and I, I have a feeling I, I'm going to credit Barbara Striplin for this because I, I think it was her that I was talking to and she said something about rather than being the person that's going to your administrative staff with a problem go to them with a solution and be the person that can can provide a solution to a problem and I think that's where you're right school librarians can sit in that very um, productive role of of seeing an issue a problem and something that they can achieve and support or may already be supporting but but is not being recognized and actually yeah. it's it's there it's about empowering the librarians to understand what an Ofsted inspection is all about and and maybe working towards you know yeah. what it is that they're looking for that you can help with and, you know, uh, yeah and I think I think the AI and chat GPT is absolutely the perfect example of that yeah. um, I mean, you know if ever there was a, a reason for a school to have an information expert absolutely uh, their staff it, here it is right here I mean we are we are the solution to what the media is you know all of this hype around it and everyone getting themselves so panicked about um the, the the potential for all sorts of cheating and all those other things that people who are not understanding the potential of what it could do the power of it to be involved in critical literacy and critical thought and all of those things you know having a librarian who knows about that stuff that that is absolutely um a, a perfect example of how we can respond to a problem and and come up with the solution so this this does, and I completely agree with you, Mary Rose. Without doubt, it's 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 school librarians' time. We, you know, we we are. It, it is the perfect um, solution because they they teach to the test is is going to have to be abandoned. I can't really see any other way around it. Unfortunately, in the UK, we have got a workforce of people who are not necessarily qualified librarians or professional librarians um, who possibly are in a library to do the administration tasks of issuing and returning books and keeping the library tidy and being there to support students reading, which all of which is really important. How do you think we can help support those schools that suddenly realise actually they do need the support of a school librarian who knows and understands critical thinking and information literacy and maybe they don't have somebody like that in their school. I, I, I think this this is the this is the issue that um, SLA and SLG have have been grappling with for such a long time because historically you know the the, the role of a school librarian is not paid well and it's it's seen as an administrative yeah. an administrative t- task yeah. and uh, of course there are lots of us I mean I I went into school librarianship in the way that many people have where um, there 
my children's new school had a, an amazing section of books, but no librarian. I'd never worked, I'd used a library for my pre, in my previous profession, but I never worked in a school and I'd never worked in a school library. But, uh, you know, I loved books and reading. So <laughs> in I went, and uh, as many have done, but yeah. as, as, as I, as I got into that job and understood, started to understand about the skills that we needed to give our children. I had friends who worked at university who were telling me that anecdotally that increasingly the students they were getting to come in in their undergraduate year at university were unable to use a library, to do research, to do any of those things. And it seemed to me to be absolutely 100% our job in school to kind of trace this golden thread back to the children that come in at three saying this is yeah. how you find stuff out and really? and that felt quite normal so as I as I realized that that's what we should be doing that is the role of the school librarian we're integral to teaching and learning it isn't just that but but you know you learn on the job and with with support of SLG who are supporting the professionalization of it and with SLA with their amazing selection of brilliant resources webinars and all those other things those two organizations taught me everything that I needed to know and and my development along that process has become it's it's moved from being um you know a nice place to go in the afternoon you know in the daytime to keep me busy so I don't go out for coffee all the time <laughs> to, to being a prof this is this is a professional vocational job that I have that I'm constantly learning on and and school librarians are about learning and about finding things out and that's not just helping others to find things out it's about helping ourselves to do the same so we have to support our colleagues to because I I don't believe that there is not anybody working in a school library who wishes they could do more and 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 if they wanted to do more we we have to support getting their role recognized as a professional role as one that deserves to be paid properly yeah. um, that uh, that their head teachers in their school are supplying them and providing them with the training they need to do those things and that they are getting the resources and the support from school that that the expectation is there for that to happen so you know it it, it is we are chameleons you know we all respond differently our, our settings are very different the place that we're working is very different our geographical setting the amount of funding we're working with the students we have in front of us is different so our while there is a core of what we should be doing we are also able to respond to what's needed in our particular setting, which is not always going to be the same from wherever you go from one place to another. You know, you may be working in a school where there is somebody who is really into media and information literacy and you work together and do all of those things. It's about understanding how to collaborate, to find the best people to help you and who you can help who are responsive to it. So, um, you know, it's it's an exciting. I mean, it's incredibly exciting. This is it's an incredibly exciting role, and particularly in the UK, where um, I think we're just getting to the point of understanding. You, you know, in I work in an international setting. I I know international librarians who work in different places, and their understanding of their role is very different. The expectation of the schools that they're working in is very different. So I think there's an awful lot we can learn from colleagues abroad as well Absolutely. to be able to show what it is we can do um, and how we can develop our role using IFLA and all of those other great places to support. Absolutely. Can I bring Alison back in? I just wanted to add and build on what Mary Rose was saying, which is, you know, I think there is, you know, there is a kind of fundamental question about what is the role of education to start with? And then what is the role of the school librarian? And I think you know, for most people, their answer to that will be a little bit different from someone else's. Absolutely. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think there is space for that individualised um, kind of way of doing things. But I do think that as a sector, we need to have some sort of sense as to what that question is and what the answer is to that question. Yeah. And I think not just for now, but in 10 years time, you know, what is education going to look like and what is the role of school librarians going to be? Because I think, you know, I know, Elizabeth, you've done a podcast recently on 
um, the plight of school librarians in Scotland. Yeah. And what's happened to there is that they have been removed in, in some authorities and replaced with library assistants. Yeah. And if if you are at the moment working and your main role is administrative and around the lending and, um, you know, the stock management side of things, I do think that you need to be willing to ask yourself the question of, is, is that important enough to justify, you know, the terms and conditions that, that we may want and expect from a school librarian? And it can be incredibly difficult to answer that question because that is the job that you've gone to do when maybe you've been stopped from building that up or you've been prevented from doing other training or, you know, just made to feel somewhat less worthy than other members of staff. But I think, you know, we do have to have a look at, you know, what the other opportunities are. And sometimes we have to answer, ask and answer really difficult questions to move things forward as a whole. Um, Absolutely. So are we talking about the fact that we would, well, <laughs> we're all, you know, Alison and I are both trainers, so we, we're obviously talking about the fact that we think training and professional development is really important. Um, how do we how do we encourage those school librarians who don't? Get, the problem is it, it's funny. Oh, let, let me start again. I, I put out a, a question on Twitter the other day and said, "What is your biggest barrier?" And I got what I expected, which was funding and money, uh, funding and time, sorry. Yeah. So we can't really do much about funding at this point in time. We really can't. We, you know, there are ways and means of you raising funds for your school library that you shouldn't have to do, but but you can. The time one is a really strange one for me because I've I've it goes back to time management and it's not saying definitely not saying that anybody working in a school library is not working to their you know they're, they're rushed off their feet but it is about thinking about the tasks that you do do and and everybody um has to move forward so I remember when I started in schools library service way back in 2003 I think it was um all of the loans that we did were written in a book and, you know, handwritten in a book. And eventually it came to the decision that we would have to automate it. That <laughs> Actually, it would be far more sense to put it on an Excel spreadsheet. You know, wow. Um, but there was resistance to that. But but I think if we can if we can encourage people to look at what their daily routines are, what are they doing? What doesn't need to be done every day and what can you be doing? What can you relax or drop a little bit in order to be able to do something a little bit extra, something a little bit more exciting? Do you think that that's where we're at? Mary Rose, you've got your hand up, so maybe you yeah, can. I, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think one of the problems is that because most librarians work on their own in a Absolutely. school with no no one else around them, um, what happens is nobody you and nobody understands what job you do. You know, I, 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 I've had some brilliant line managers. They're wonderful, but they I have no idea of about of about sort of seventy percent of the stuff that I that I do. And so, um, that time management thing is 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 fine, but it, and it you, one should be doing it. And I'm always thinking, hang on a second, I'm spending an awful lot of time doing this when I should be doing something else. But but it's very difficult to manage that when you've got nobody else to to manage it with you or for you or, you know, this is why these networks that we, you know, SLA, SLG, um, the one that you've got, Elizabeth, um, that GSL, you know, creating spaces for people to be able to talk to each other and challenge each other because it's you know you you often do need to be challenged you know you someone does need to say right I need this in by now so mm -hmm. so the only thing really that I'm expected to do on a you know that someone's looking to me for is my budget every year no one's asking me for my school report or my library report nobody's asking me for um a, a, an annual 
statistics and all, all those other things. So, of course, I say I must do those things. But then when I think about it, I think what impact does that have directly on the children that I'm not working with? Zero. So I'm going to put it at the bottom of my list and I'm going to just swing around and make sure that what I'm doing is directly impacting the children. For, you know, that, that that is where it goes. So. Um, so you, you do that, but then you get caught up in some kind of admin thing or the database isn't working or whatever else it is. And suddenly three days have gone by when you've been looking at a database, changing people's names and doing all those other things. I think that's three days where I haven't done the great reading adventure I was going to be setting up with those. And 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 I've, so it's it is, I think. While I totally agree with you that time management is really important, it is very, very difficult to do when, when you're when you're a solo operator. But then and that's where we come down to the fact that we need to create yeah, these networks. We need to create networks. We need to almost create something that's a bit maybe more than than is currently available. So so you know, there are Facebook groups out, out there that are that are sort of work you know they share ideas and yeah. they 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 excite each other and they push each other along but maybe they need to be slightly more focused you know I, I I'm a member of the AIIP which is the Association of International Information Professionals and they give you an accountability buddy and I find that real as a as a business person who works on her own I find that really really useful because every week someone's going to be saying to me you said last week you were going to do <laughs> and it's like okay well maybe I didn't but what was the reason that I didn't do it and and I can then sometimes just just fob it off do you know life gets in the way sometimes but other times it's like I really said I wanted to, I, I was going to do that because I wanted to do it and I'm going to speak to her on Thursday okay let's crack on and get it done and I think I think you're right lone librarians working on their own do have a problem and and maybe there needs to be a little bit more support from somewhere in a different way. I, I'm throwing it out there. Anyway, that accountability Alison. bit is good. I like that bit about accountability. Yeah. Uh, having, having somebody that you work with or someone to just hold you account to say, hang on, where are those things that, that, we, said, that yeah. we said we're going to do? I mean, yeah. you know, line managers meeting should be that that's and that does happen, actually. You know, I one does. But I think just on a day to day basis to help somebody to, for somebody to help you be able to kind of see the wood for the trees. Yeah. 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 Um, Can I bring Alison back in? Um, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, I think sometimes as well, it's not just about the time, but it's about the type of time that you need. Yeah. And if you were about to undertake training for something that you want to do, you think is important, but you've never delved into before, you need that kind of ability for that deep work to not be interrupted, to lose yourself in it, to really focus in it. And you also need like the emotional bandwidth to do that. Because whenever you start learning something new, it's all you feel vulnerable and you feel a bit messy and like you're maybe not ever going to get to grips with it. And I think for a lot of people, you know, particularly in the UK, where it can feel quite relentless working in a school library, I think sometimes that that kind of bandwidth, as well as the quality of the time, isn't isn't there and isn't that available. Yeah. Well, I, well, I can I can relate to that immediately because the AI stuff is freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> I will get to the top of it or bottom of it, but but you uh, know, so so we you know even I suppose that wave of something new is coming, something that we should be on top of. It's an opportunity. Do you think you know what skills do you think that school librarians? need to focus on maybe more now than than ever to move forward in this new world is it is it an opportunity do you think are we are we you know is there something that you'd highlight us as, as something that's more important than something else or is it as always just us finding our I way I don't think it's a particular skill set necessarily but I think it's there's almost an attitude um, and a kind of willingness to engage you know I definitely say creativity was on the list 
um, determination, probably, because we're going to have to push through a bit harder. Um, and that that passion, you know, there are lots of school librarians who go into it for lots of different reasons, but a lot of them have a passion, whether that is learning and you know, helping pupils develop and find themselves or the books or the stories, you know, whatever it is, tapping into that passion to then put in the other stuff that you're perhaps less interested in. Because even if you're there for, you know, the books and and the re and the pure kind of reading side of it, there's not there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But AI is going to change that. And there is going to be a relationship and an impact on that. So you, we still need to, I don't think there's any space for kind of walls to be put up, but we can just say that's not my thing. Absolutely. I think we need to have a kind of really broad view and be horizon scanning all the time. Yeah. Sabrina, can I bring you in? Yeah, I mean, Alison's mentioned some of the stuff I was going to say, but certainly as a school librarian who's been doubting if this is what she wants to do for the last few months. Don't worry, I'm okay. Um, <laughs> but very much it's like, well, why am I doing this? And it's like, because I have a passion for the reading side of things. But since I've been doing this job, it's a passion to support my students and their well-being and their identity. And it's so much more than I ever thought librarianship was. And for me it's been about in jumping in and embracing all that new stuff that I didn't really associate with being in a library and that's what's kind of kept me going and that's what I keep learning about and advocating for and standing up for these students and making sure that they have their voices heard that they feel seen and giving them the tools to speak up for themselves and that's very much what I've been learning to do so I think yeah, you're hundred percent right, Alison. You've got a passion, but it's also about keeping your mind open, being able to just say, "Hey, I don't know anything about this. Let's just go and find out. Let's just just give this a go and see what happens." Absolutely, because le learning, you know, you can you can always, you know, it you know it can always go wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just because something's gone wrong doesn't mean to say that you should never have tried. And and actually, that no. is part of the journey, isn't it? I think absolutely. You know, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so in all the years that I've been working in school libraries, there's always been a negative undercurrent and a feeling of doom. So, are things as bad as they seem? Can you tell us how you see the future of school libraries going forward, Alison? Um, I mean, I think the future is bright. I probably wouldn't be in the role that I'm in if I didn't think that was the case. So, uh, maybe a bit of bias kicking in, but I do think the future is bright. You know, I've already said that I think the needle has moved in terms of the conversation around school libraries in the UK in the past three or four years. Reading both for pleasure and learning underpins education, and that is far more widely understood now than ever before. Media and information literacy skills are absolutely vital, and the conversation around that is developing and engaging and building to a policy point policy point that doesn't at the moment mention school libraries but there's an opportunity there um and I think you know we're also talking about AI and machine learning and the impact that's going to have on careers of the future and I think we really need to be highlighting the fact that school library school librarianship and school libraries and what we enable builds curiosity and creativity and all of those things that children are going to need you know they're going to need to be able to find their own information and to uh, properly assess it and that's not just in terms of a career and ensuring that you know they're able to to think in a different way in inverted commas to the AI but also it's about the kind of country that we want to live in you know if we have masses of younger people who then get older and who aren't as able to engage in democracy then that erodes the whole foundation of kind of who we are and what the country does and I think you know we kind of it's 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 a it's a, a flaw in in us as humans that means we're always pulled to the negative yeah. and that's why we get clickbait and that's why we have you know 
media that just prints the guff rather than looking for the good. Yeah. I think that kind of happens a bit in school libraries. But I also think there's an, another element to it, which is the school libraries where good stuff is happening. You know, the, the research showed that 25% of secondary school, school librarians are seen as a head of department. Now, that's much higher than we had anticipated. And I think that part of the reason we don't hear those stories is because no one wants to be seen to diminish the hard times that other school librarians are going through. Yeah. You don't want to be the one who comes out and says, well, my life is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know? And so I think, you know, we don't tell those good stories amongst ourselves enough either. Mm. And I think, you know, that's something that we're trying to do both with the campaign and with the awards. But I think, you know, don't be afraid to tell those stories. If something good is happening, you know, maybe choose who you tell it to. If you know someone's just gone through a really difficult time, maybe choose your audience. But yeah. I know that all three, four of us on this call would love to hear those positive stories. Um, and we just need to you know, to, we need to be aware that those things are happening as well, because otherwise it just, it it really does, the sector erodes itself if it's only bad news. Absolutely. You know, we've got to show that there's something worth saving as well as something worth fighting for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you want to add anything to that, Mary Rosa? Has that covered it? <laughs> yeah, well, I know. I mean, I, I mean, Alison has said exactly, exactly that. I mean, I, th I, I think, you know, like we are, while we are, quiet revolutionaries and we we are there to to shake boundaries we're there to we we want to model what we do that what we want to see in our children we're modeling we're modeling pushing those boundaries and asking big questions and think thinking critically about what is in front of us and and actually um if we but we're we're so good you know li librarians don't like um, standing up and shouting about how, all the great things we do we're you know we're we, we're quiet revolutionaries but but we need to learn how to stand up and and really shout about it and advocate for what we do and show the people we work with what we can do show people in other schools in other areas show each other show our head teachers what it is that we can do and that there are loads of ways you can do that you know I, I mean coming through that our, our campaign website has got lots of ideas that you can do to talk about to to promote the the campaign to promote your own work to promote the work of the school librarians by writing to mps but both sla and slg have lots of things lots of places on their websites and um, mechanisms to go through to help you learn more about how to advocate um, and and advocate for yourself but also for the wider sector um, you know twitter twitter is a great place to get on and make your voice heard for people to find out such a lovely community of passionate people who are ready to listen so you know social media is it has got lots of ways that we can we can do that and have our voice amplified so, so while we're um, we we need to learn how to be a little bit more a bit louder about what we do and promote Absolutely. ourselves. And uh, uh, you know, I think I think librarians generally tend to be quite introverted. Um, it's the nature of the job, but I think they're not very good at at talking about how good they are at what they do, and that is definitely something that needs to change. Um, before I finish, I'm going to ask you one more question, but I just want to take this opportunity to promote my membership. So to any schools who are looking to, for support in collaboration between teachers and librarian, helping to boost independent learning, literacy and well-being through your school library. If you're not sure how to make this happen, my membership programme offers training and support for school librarians and teachers and creates opportunities to engage across the whole curriculum. So you can find out more about my membership in the links below, but I will also be putting up the SLA and SLG links so you can find us all because we're all brilliant. <laughs> so, so if you have one last thing that you want to say to a school librarian that's sitting here thinking, wow, I should get involved, you know, what is the one thing that you would say that they could do tomorrow that would make a difference to the whole school library community? Sabrina, go on then, go first. Uh, you're on mute. Sorry. 
I said go on social media. <laughs> go on social media. Go on social media. It's all I did. Yeah. Absolutely. It does make a huge difference. Um, what about you, Mary Rose? Um, I think writing to your local MP, the more voices they're hearing, the more letters they're getting from librarians, but also from people you work with in schools, getting your get getting that campaign up and, get, and making a loud fuss to those of those people who are representing us in Westminster is is a really important thing to do you can download the template from the GSL website um, and and there are lots of other things on there that you can do too but I would say just bombard your local MP with letters <laughs> sounds great and what about you Alison um I think it's about I quite often talk about advocacy with a big A, which is the big national campaigns that are trying to have the conversations with policymakers, but then also talk about advocacy with a small A, which is the stuff that you do that think it doesn't matter, but it yeah. does matter. Because without that, the narrative that we're telling at a national level isn't accurate. So it's it's probably just to not give up, just keep doing whatever it is that you're doing that's having an impact. And and don't let people kind of make you feel that whatever you're trying to do isn't worth it. So whether it's writing that annual report that maybe gets read and maybe it doesn't, instead of sharing it with just your line manager, share it with your colleagues and your friends and, you know, get those people to kind of read it and give you feedback. Um, just, yeah, don't give up doing the little things that you don't think have an impact because actually all of those ripples together, they do they do have an impact. They do, yeah. And, and you're not alone. I think that's the, the mm. message that I would say is that there are others out there. Find your clan, share your happy stories, share your mm. successes. I think it's all really, really important. So thank you for joining me today, Alison, Mary Rose. And Sabrina, it's been a real interesting, I love talking school libraries, so it's a great chat that we've had tonight. So I hope we've encouraged some of our listeners to join the campaign and see more schools with libraries in the future. Don't forget to subscribe to my podcast um, so you don't miss out on future discussions. Thank you for listening and good night.